Hello, everyone. Firstly, welcome to you. It's great to be here with you once again, a little off schedule, which brings me to my second point. Apologies from the First Presbyterian Church of Martinsville, Indiana. We had a little snafu yesterday. It was a small technical glitch that resulted in a large technical glitch. We all know how that happened. Happens, rather. We, uh, we did fix the glitch. Um, it will not happen this Sunday or again. And we will be live and online and in-person worship on this coming Sunday, August 16th. Instead of recreating the entire worship service for you today, however, what I've decided to do is read you the scripture and, and preach you my sermon and, and hope that it gives you uh, spiritual sustenance, sustenance and, and a, a little bit of flavor for what it's like to be here at First Presbyterian Church of Martinsville and maybe even a thing or two to think of and about throughout the week. Our scripture lesson comes from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 14, verses 22 to 33. I invite you to listen for the word of God to you today. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he dismissed the crowds, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat battered by the waves was far from shore, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me, please? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. For the life of me, I cannot figure out what Peter was thinking that morning. Here we are in the middle of an early morning storm. The sun isn't up yet. And the disciples see a figure coming towards them, walking on the water. People don't walk on water. So their first inclination in terrific fear is to think, it's a ghost because people don't walk on water. Spirits, maybe. So they think it's a ghost. But of course, they're terrified. And they cry out. And Jesus says to them, take heart. It is I. Don't be afraid. Like that's supposed to calm their fear. He's walking on water. People don't walk on water he comes closer to the boat and Peter, Peter, for some reason I cannot fathom, blurts out, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. What? What, what put that into his head? Where did he ever think, when did he ever think that would be a good idea? Did, did the other disciples on the boat hear that and say, oh, hey, that's a great idea. 
I want to try that too. Hey, Jesus, would you call me out on the water also? I want to come with Peter. What made him think that that would be a good idea? I mean, he says, if it is you, which means there's a chance in his head that it's not. So what are we suggesting here? If it is you, command me to come to you on the water. If it isn't you, I'll get out of the boat and sink like a rock. I don't know about those choices. If it is you, command me to come to the water with you, onto the water with you. And Jesus' response is, come on out. Come on out. And Peter, his, his impulses far ahead of his rational mind, goes out and walks on water. He's actually walking towards Jesus on water. And then what his, his brain catches up, he, he gets distracted, he loses. What does he lose? Does he lose his, his concentration, his, his trust, his, his faith, his, his crazy making adrenaline? The scripture says the wind apparently frightens him and he goes down. He starts sinking into the water. Now, Jesus' response is often described as a rebuke, but, but it doesn't seem like that to me. It doesn't seem like a rebuke. It, it seems almost playful, frankly. It's almost like, why did you doubt you of little faith? You had it. You were doing it. It's almost like a parent teaching a child to ride a two-wheel bicycle. You, you let go and the kid sails off in perfect balance, but in a moment of self-consciousness, she falters. Her balance goes and over she goes. And the parent calls out, you did it. You were doing it. You can do it. I sometimes wonder why Jesus didn't ask Peter to, to just try one more time. Get back up on that bike, kid. Get back up on that water, Peter. You can do it. But Jesus, of course, meets Peter's panic and his cry of, Lord, save me, with an outstretched arm and, and the gentle encouragement of a parent. You did it. You did it. Your faith can move mountains. Why did you doubt? Now, I can't understand why Peter asked Jesus to come out onto the water with him. That one eludes me. But if I were Peter, and I had just done that, if I had just walked on water, and Jesus responded by chiding me, by saying I had little faith and asking me why I doubted, my answer might go something like this. Me of little faith? Did you not see that? I was just walking on water. And yeah, Jesus, I got scared because I've never walked on water before in the middle of a storm. Come to think of it, I've never seen you walk on water before. In fact, I've never seen anybody walk on water before. So yeah, I got a little scared. Me of little faith. <laughs> when I was interviewing with the PNC, the pastor nominating committee, one of the questions that they asked of me had to do with something I wrote in my personal information form, which is my resume. I said in my resume that I want to serve a church where, where the questions are important, as important as the answers because I wholeheartedly believe that they are. A faith that cannot withstand questions and doubts, well, it's not a very strong faith. Questions and, and questioning our beliefs and our faith, doubts and, and doubting our beliefs and our faith, I think is not only part and parcel of our spiritual journey, but it really is the sign of a growing and mature faith. To, to go through life and never question what we learned in Sunday school, it, 
is not the point. Never questioning, never doubting, never struggling with it is not the point. In fact, it's really the sign of an unexamined faith journey. Because it is, it's only by questioning what we think we know, what we think we believe, that we begin to understand what we really don't believe, what we really do in fact believe, and what really matters to us. As Frederick Buechner, that incredible preacher, once said, doubts are the ants in the pants of faith. They keep it awake and moving. And Reverend Beekner and I are no, by no means alone in thinking that, that doubts and questions really are an essential part of faith. You've heard of Madeline Langle, the, the celebrated author. She once said this, she said, the minute we begin to think we know all the answers, we forget the questions and we become smug like the Pharisee who listed all of his considerable virtues and thank God that he was not like the other men. Those who believe they believe in God, she says. Those who believe they believe in God, but without passion in the heart, without anguish of mind, without uncertainty, without doubt, and even without at times despair, believe only in the idea of God, not God himself. And even our own John Calvin, our spiritual and theological forefather who gave us so much of the theology that our Protestant tradition and our Reformed tradition relies on, once said this. He said, surely we cannot imagine any certainty that is not tinged with doubt or any assurance that is not assailed by some anxiety. And he's right. He's right. I'm not going to stand here today and try to convince you that, that horror movies, there are many horror movies, actually have theological concepts at their core and really throughout their stories. And I'm not gonna stand up here and try to do that today. I may one of these days. But if you were to ask me to give you an illustration from a movie that explores this concept of doubt and questioning God, it comes from a horror movie. Comes from a horror movie called The Stand, which is actually a miniseries put out in the mid 80s. It's based on Stephen King's novel of the same name. I won't go through the full plot synopsis, it's quite long. However, I think it is enough for you to know that in the story there is a terrible pandemic. It is an awful pandemic that makes the coronavirus look like a case of the sniffles. It actually kills off most of the world's population in, in very short order. And it comes down to a struggle between the forces of good and the forces of evil. And there is a, a character named Mother Abigail. Mother Abigail is an old black woman filled with love and joy and faith and doubt and questions. She represents the power and presence of God in the story before her untimely end. And God is gathering a remnant of folks around Mother Abigail to be the force of good, to fight the forces of evil. And she's trying to explain the best she can what God is doing when another seminal character in the story named Nick kind of pushes back on her. And he says, basically, well, he doesn't say anything. He actually can't speak. But essentially, he says, Mother Abigail, I don't believe in God. And her response, her response is priceless. She throws back her head. She breaks into a laughter like it's the funniest thing she's heard in a long time. And she laughs not at him, but certainly not with him. He doesn't know what's going on. And when she finally stops laughing, she says, 
God bless you, Nick. But it don't matter. God believes in you. First time I watched the miniseries, I noted that, but I didn't really notice it. I was in my mid-teens. I was, I was too young. Second time I saw it, I had lived a little more. I'd questioned a little more. I doubted a little more, and it did. It moved me. It made me remember it. The third time I watched it, yes, I've seen it a couple of times. The third time I watched it, I'd lived even more. And I'd questioned a lot more. And I doubted a lot more. I'd gone through seasons of unbelief. And God was still alive and active in my life, moving in my life. And when Mother Abigail laughed her laugh, I did too. A joyous, hope-filled laughter. And then I started to cry started to cry, a hard cry, because of the truth of it. The incredible truth of it and the absolute affirmation of Mother Abigail's words, it don't matter. God believes in you. That's what matters. As if as if our doubt could somehow stop the living God from moving in our lives and in the world. As if our questioning could ever change anything about the love of God. As if unbelief can stop the creator of the universe. No, I don't buy it. I don't buy it and I stand with Paul. I am convinced that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Even our doubts, even our questions, and even our seasons of unbelief. Friends, the point of this story is not a rebuke of doubt or even a warning that doubt will somehow invariably drag us under the waves and into the water that doubt is to be avoided at all costs. No. No, the point of this story is that we serve a God that promises to lift us out of the murky depths, to lift us out of the chaos of the storm, we serve a God who stands by, ready to seize us and lift us out of the windswept waters of life. We are loved by a God who hears us when we cry and reaches down to save us, even in the midst of our doubts, even in the midst of our questions, even in the midst of our unbelief, God stands ready to reach the divine arm down and save us from the waters. That is the point of this story. May it be so for you. May it be so for me. Amen. And thank you so much for joining me today.